Well, again, I want to welcome everybody here today, men and women, but first of all, men, especially to you, thank you for being here this morning. And uh, also, especially to those of you men who are fathers, thank you for being here today because you could have slept in, you could have uh, been fishing or whatever you enjoyed doing, golfing or just hanging out at the house, whatever. Thank you for taking the time this morning uh, to come here into this place and to honor either a family member uh, or somebody that you're here with and hopefully also to honor God. So thank you again. And in fact, what I'd like to do um, is if you are here today and you are a father, a dad, would you just stand and remain standing for a moment? Don't worry, I'm not going to do anything weird. I'm just, all you got to do is stand. All you got to do is stand, that's it. So, and, and in a moment, I, we'll show our appreciation, but I, this is important. I don't, we don't do this often enough. I've done this some in the past. But in our culture today, I don't know about you, but I'm just so tired of hearing about the constant war between men and women. And in the political circles, we constantly hear the phrase, the war against women. And the fact is, there's a war against women and there's a war against men. Amen, guys? <laughs> Oh, I'm getting in trouble already. <laughs> There's going to be some people probably walking. My point is, we're all in a war, and that war is a spiritual war. And our enemy is not each other. Our enemy is Satan. And the one who offers strength and help is God. And what Satan does is he'll get our eyes off of him, off of Satan, because he doesn't want us you know, to even be aware of him. And he wants to get us fussing, fighting with each other, criticizing each other, putting each other down. And when that happens, he wins and God is not honored. So I want you to understand that everything I share with you today is out of a heart of love from God for you and God wants both men and women to be honored. He wants both mothers, which we did last month, to be honored, and he also wants fathers to be honored. Can I hear an amen? All right. I don't think some of you are convinced. <laughs> and I'm not going to ask you to say it again, but hopefully you'll be convinced. So while you men are standing, this is what I want you to hear, because we hear so much about how, well, you know, in our culture today, um, and we all understand the importance of motherhood. But, you know, as long as a child has a mother and a caring community around, the kids are going to be okay. They'll be just fine. Well, men, I want you to know that the truth is, as they have done research over the past 20 years of family, and you don't hear about this in the news, but you can go check out the facts. In fact, there's some websites called um, the National Fatherhood Initiative and the National Center for Fathering that will have these statistics listed for you to encourage you. And so ladies, I would encourage you to check out these websites as well and just understand that both women and men, mothers and fathers are absolutely necessary for the health and the good of our children and our culture. So here's some things as these dads are standing. Several reputable studies over the last 20 years from various places have indicated beyond a shadow of a doubt that the presence of a responsible father significantly reduces childhood poverty in the life of a family and in a culture. The presence of a responsible father promotes the physical health and safety of their children. The presence of a responsible father prevents child abuse and neglect. We hear so much about the few small percentage of those who are abusive either physically or sexually, that sometimes we get so sensitive to that and we don't realize the truth is that kids without a responsible dad in their life suffer much more sexual, physical violence and abuse of various kinds. So men, dads, you're important in your family and in your child's life. The presence of a responsible father has a direct effect on behavioral and emotional outcomes of children. The presence of a responsible father plays a key role in delaying sexual activity and reducing teen pregnancy in the life of their daughters, especially in their sons. The presence of a responsible father reduces crime and delinquency among youth and also the likelihood that children will suffer substance abuse. Now we know that these things do happen even though you can try to be the best dad you can be, these things can still happen, but statistics prove out that it greatly at least reduces the negative things and increases the positive things in a child's life. 
So what I'd like for all of us to do is let's encourage these men, these dads, and say thank you for fathers. Can we do that? So thank you guys. Thank you for being here. Thank you for honoring God. Thanks, you be seated. So hopefully that didn't hurt too bad. <laughs> um, but I do think it's important for us to celebrate that. I, I know um, growing up when I was young, uh, and I'm sure they were reruns, they weren't the actual shows, but there were shows on TV in black and white. Uh, <laughs> uh, but shows like Father Knows Best, My Three Sons, Leave It to Beaver, and even though as a kid I would watch those shows and I would see the model of the dads on there and the family situations, I knew it wasn't exactly like how our home was. But honestly, for me as a kid, I'm like, you know what, that's pretty cool. It, for me, was a role model or something I wanted to aspire to. And quite frankly, I'm tired of hearing people refer back to those shows as being unrealistic or whatever. Yeah, we get it. Maybe it was unrealistic. Maybe it wasn't like how every home was. But at least a model was being put before our culture of something healthy. Rather than dads being portrayed in TV shows and sitcoms now as being slobs, irresponsible, party animals, you know, whatever. Is that really the role model that you want for dads to follow? And granted, yeah, there's dads and there's men and there's people like that, but it all goes back to what is the model you want before people? What, what is the standard that we want to, to aspire to? And God has taught us from the very beginning, and that's why it's recorded in his word, and historically, when you look at cultures, and you look at societies, and you look at nations, even nations throughout history that don't claim to follow God, they still have some of these basic principles of fatherhood and motherhood because it is best for a society. And when we abandon those things, society is going to decay. It's going to crumble. And we see that happening before our very eyes in our culture here in America today. This is not meant to beat anyone up. It's meant to call our sensibilities to a reality and to stop being lulled to sleep uh, or, or being convinced of something that is not true. Um, so my prayer is we will see the truth of what God's word teaches us. And that's why God ordained fatherhood as an important foundational standard for any society. In fact, in the Old Testament, when we read that God chose the nation of Israel, when he chose Abraham and his descendants through Isaac, God wanted to set a model before the world of how to live differently because the world at that time was, was in a bad shape and everybody was doing their own thing, going by what they felt was best. And God said, I want to choose a people and I want to show what can happen when a people will truly honor me, follow me, put my laws into place. They can be a successful society as long as they continue to follow my guidelines, my standard for living. And that's why of the Ten Commandments that he gave, along with many others for the nation of Israel, but the main top ten, the priorities were, first of all, to honor God above all else. That, that's where they all started from. That was, that was rule number one. Don't have any other idols. Love the Lord your God. Worship him. Acknowledge him because he's the one that gives you life. He's the one that loves you, wants to give you strength and help you through this life and even has a plan for you when this physical life on this earth is over for all eternity. But then right after he set up those in his top ten commandments for the nation or for the society to follow, the very first one that deals relationally with each other within the culture was, it included the phrase, honor your father and your mother, and then it went on from there. Now, I understand, as we said, fathers have flaws. We've, I speak to you today as a flawed father. I'm so thankful that God has allowed me to be a dad but I acknowledge that I am by no means perfect and just asking my kids and they'll, they'll verify that. But I do aspire to want to live my life in a way that honors God and helps them and I'm, I, I want to do the best I can. But I'm telling you, I admit my flaws and my mistakes. So I'm not here in any way talking down on you. I don't want you to look at it that way. We're all in this together. But with those flaws, I understand that God does offer strength and help for those flaws and forgiveness for those flaws and a way that we can overcome those flaws and live in a way that, that still points to him that hopefully our children can be appreciative of and follow. So when God says, honor your father, if you, if you have a dad or had a dad that was not 
you know, the best dad in, in your mind's eye or whatever with how he treated you or, or does treat you. Just understand that when God said honor your father, he's talking about group-wise as a society. We need to honor the position of fatherhood. And we need to honor the position of motherhood. And then, yes, we understand as flawed, sinful people, broken people, in those roles, we're going to fail at times. But again, God holds forth the standard to say, I want you to be good dads. I want you to be good moms. And as kids, even if your parents aren't the best, you still need to learn to honor them because there's something even positive for your own soul and your own spirit when you honor your parents, even if maybe they weren't the best parents. God will honor you for honoring them and honor that position. But when a father accepts the responsibility by treating his wife and his children properly, the family prospers. And when a father neglects his duties to do that, not only the family suffers, but culture suffers and the nation as a whole suffers. And that is why the Bible teaches not only in the Old Testament, to honor your father and your mother, but also in the New Testament in Colossians, we're reminded of this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, yield to the authority of your husbands in the Lord. And children, obey your parents in all things. Here again, this is a structure for a healthy society. And then in Ephesians 4, it says this, fathers, do not exasperate your children in other words, don't be overly harsh. Absolutely, as dads, we need to discipline our kids. We need, kids need that. We need it. But in so doing, we've got to be careful not to be overly harsh. We need to make sure that it's done with a heart of love and in a proper manner. So fathers, do not exasperate your children, but raise your children in the training and instruction of the Lord. And of course, uh, of course the Lord there is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ following his model for manhood and how to, to treat others as he is our intermediary, uh, he's our intercessor, he's our savior, he is our Lord. So there's just three things I want to go through quick, guys, because I know tension spans uh, maybe are pretty quick. In fact, I kind of find it humorous. This has nothing to do with the sermon, but it has to do with attention spans. I just found out last week that I guess in the NFL now, when training camp goes, they're, they're giving the guys, because the guys coming out of college are so used to cell phones and all the technology, that literally during their two-hour training sessions, after 30 minutes, they're giving them a 10-minute phone break. No joke. No joke, in the NFL, they're giving the players a 10-minute phone. You know, it used to be a smoke break, coffee break. Well, now it's a phone break. <laughs> because our culture, our kids are being raised so much with quick attention spans and all that that even in the NFL, you're getting paid lots of money and being put on a big stage. And it's like, are you kidding me? They can't sit for two hours, but there you go. There's the culture we live in. So I'll try to be right to the point today and move through this quickly. So three things, keep it simple, because I don't know about you guys, but for me, I need to kind of keep it simple. Three foundational fatherhood principles, and I've spoken on this before, but if you're like me, you need to be reminded of it. So here's three things, guys, that we need to focus on, whether you're a dad or not, and even moms and women, you can learn from this too, but since we're talking to dads today, I want to encourage you this. The pattern principle the partition, uh, participation principle, that's hard to say, and the proclamation. So three things, pattern, participation, and proclamation. Because if we will focus on these three foundational principles as dads, I believe it will help our families to be better. It will help us to be better men. It will help our society to move in a better direction. So first of all, the pattern principle, and it's, it's a well-known fact that children tend to imitate what they see and emulate what they are taught. So we are role models for our kids, whether we like to think of ourselves as such or not. The question is, what kind of a role model are you? Because kids will tend to imitate or emulate what they see modeled before them. So the question is, what kind of a role model are you? Will your kids find your life and your pattern of life something that is worth imitating? Or will they actually look at your life and find it as a way of some things that they don't want to imitate or emulate? It really can work either way. So let's just personalize it a little bit. Dads, your sons will decide by your pattern of living and what you've modeled for them whether they want to grow up in some measure to be like you or not. 
Now, I know none of us want to be exactly like our parents necessarily. We all have our little bit of our rebellious side. But overall, your sons are going to decide whether they want to, for the most part, be like you or not uh, based on the pattern that you have lived out before them. In their work ethic, the way that they treat their family and the relationships that they have with others and certainly their relationship with God, with Christ and the way they live their life. Well, what about daughters? Well, dads, your daughters will decide based on your pattern for living whether they want to marry a guy like you or not. They will decide whether they want to marry a man who treats their wife, their kids, their church, their family, their community like you, or they want to marry somebody different. And again, kids are going to make their choices. You can do the best you can, and kids will still make mistakes and make bad choices. And here again, when I say that, I know I did in my life. And God steered me and got me back on the right path again. And that's the wonderful thing about grace and forgiveness in Christ is he gives us second chances, sometimes third chances or more if we need him in his wisdom and his grace. But we just need to be careful and not take that for granted. So the question is, what pattern for living uh, are you giving? And then I want to take a moment to just think on this. I don't want to dwell too long, but I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I want you to think about this. When I ask you this question, what's the first thing that pops into your mind? What pattern for living did your dad give you? So don't answer it, but what pattern for living did your dad give you? And your immediate response, was it a positive thing? Did you think of some good things? Or was the first response, ooh, oh, eh, I don't even like that. I don't want to think about it. A lot of that does kind of tell you the importance of what kind of pattern you're going to set for your kids and for others. I would encourage you that, again, as fathers, we're all flawed. But I encourage you to try to look at some good things that your dad modeled for you in some way or continues to. And certainly I encourage you to make those choices that will help you to pattern positive things. Don't want to belabor too long on this, but just real quickly, biblically, we can see how this pattern principle uh, started from, uh, as it recorded back in Genesis. Genesis chapter 4, verses 17 through 22. You see, we are good as a human race about passing on things that we learn from one generation to the next. So talking about this pattern principle, we're good about passing on worldly knowledge, but sometimes we struggle in passing on godly knowledge. And what I want you to see with this balance here is, are these two things compared, is they're absolutely, as we pass on worldly knowledge, technology, things about uh, construction, building, all of the things that we do that we build from the last generation, we learn and we make new things for the next generation. As we're passing on worldly knowledge, don't neglect godly knowledge. And this is my fear of where we're at right now as a nation. As a nation, we were founded on passing on Christian principles, godly principles, but we're at a tipping point in our nation now where people are saying, well, that's not really all that important. We're going to keep on passing on the worldly knowledge, but the godly stuff is holding us back. So let's cast that off and let's not worry about passing that on to the next generation. Let's get rid of that and let's just focus on the worldly knowledge. And there's danger in that, great danger. In Genesis 4.17 Cain is the one who got jealous of Abel, murdered him. He committed the, the, the first murder, and he suffered consequences and for that. And because of that, he just kind of turned his back on God and said, okay, I'm just going to get out here in the world and do things. And we see this pattern now in Cain's life in Genesis 4, 17. Then Cain's wife became pregnant, gave birth to a son, and they named him Enoch. When Cain founded a city, he named it Enoch after his son. There's the pattern. Enoch was the father of Erad. Erad was the father of Mahuyel. Mahuyel was the father of Methusiel. Methusiel was the father of Lamech. Let's get a real... <laughs> Uh, Lamech married two women, so there's the first polygamy incident recorded in Scripture. So we see way early on this idea of having multiple marriages and changing the definition of marriage. It's not new. It's been around, but God has said it's not the best way to go. 
Lamech married two women, Ada and Zillah. Ada gave birth to a baby named Jabel. He became the first of the herdsmen who live in tents. So he began to, as he learned that, how to make tents, he taught that knowledge on to his sons, relatives, and how to, they learned how to herd and, uh, with sheep and, and cattle and various things, and they began to pass that knowledge on. His brother's name was Jubal, the first musician, the inventor of the harp and the flute. So there you go, and he passed on that knowledge of how to make those instruments and play them, and then they built on that and they built more instruments. To Lamech's uh, other wife, Zillah, was born Tubal-Cain. He was the first to work with metal, forging instruments of bronze and iron, and on and on it goes. So we see historically mankind has been good about passing on worldly knowledge from one generation to the next, but what about godly knowledge? Because we see nothing in this line of godly knowledge. And here's the danger. So, in a few verses on down in Genesis 4, 25 and 26, we see this. Adam, who of course was our ultimate forefather, the first human male with Eve, the first human female. Adam lay with his wife again and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in the place of Abel since Cain killed him. Seth also had a same son and named him Enosh. At that time, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. So now we see Seth in his birth and in his line of his followers, they begin to say, okay, God, we know we've messed up, but we want to know more of you. We know we've lost our way. We want you in our lives. And as we begin to read on in Genesis, you can kind of see this trail of two separate paths going, the, the descendants of Cain and their line and the descendants of Seth and their line. And really today, just to bring it relevant in your personal life, we all are faced with that same kind of a choice in our personal life. Are we going to follow our own way of ignoring God and just going after worldly knowledge and passing that on? Or are we going to follow the line like Seth and actually begin to seek God, call upon his name, pass on that godly knowledge, learn it for ourselves, but pass it on to our kids and to others? And that's a choice that each of us have to make. So the question is, where is your pattern for living coming from? Uh, what pattern are you giving your kids to follow in the way that you pray, in the way that you demonstrate whether you're willing to learn more about God and being teachable? Uh, what are you teaching them in the way that you worship God, in the way that you work, in the way that you play and entertain yourself, and how is God included in those things, or is he, included, is he excluded? Because that's setting a pattern for our kids. What about the way you serve Christ in the church or the way that you lead in your community or in your job or the way that you obey? In Deuteronomy 6, uh, 6 and 7, it says this, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts, impress them on your children. God was telling uh, the early leaders, make sure that they pass on godly knowledge along with the worldly knowledge that they gain. The second thing is the participation principle. So we've talked a lot about pattern. I won't spend as much time on these two, but participation uh, pattern. I already shared with you at the beginning of the message the importance of dads being involved in the life of their kids and in the life of the family, being actively involved. There's statistics. I could give you a lot more statistics. I won't take the time to do that now. But this is another foundational principle we have to understand as men and as dads that whether our kids act like they want us to be around or not, they really do. And so we need to make that time for them. And if your kids don't enjoy doing what you do, find out what they enjoy doing and then spend time doing that with them. But make sure that you are letting your kids know by your physical presence or uh, the, the time that you spend talking with them, listening, that you love them. Uh, how much time are you spending with your kids just listening to them, uh, learning, worshiping together, serving God, or experiencing life together? Do you know what your kid's favorite musical artist is right now? Because it'll change. <laughs> you might know the style of music they like, but do you know their current favorite musical artist? If not, ask them. It's, it's that simple, you know, and you may get, oh, whatever, but make some efforts. Do you know what their favorite color is? Do you know if they're still in school? Do you know who their favorite teacher is? Or you probably know their least favorite teacher. <laughs> so they have a way of letting you know that. Uh, 
Again, ask questions of your kids that just can't be answered yes or no. Ask questions that encourage them to give a response. And even if you get the cold shoulder at first, don't stop asking. Because actually, this is the model that God has set for us. Do you know that though, maybe perhaps some of you here today, I don't know, I don't know any of your walk spiritually or where you're at, but perhaps some of you here today have been giving God the cold shoulder. But you know what? He hasn't given up on you. He's still seeking you out. He's still knocking. He's still asking. So why should we be surprised when we love our kids and we try to get to know them and we ask them questions and they give us the cold shoulder? We'll stop and think because you might be doing the same thing to God. But we need to follow God's pattern and not give up and keep seeking after our kids and letting them know that we love them and we want to be in a relationship with them because that is what God is doing for us. So the, and that's what God has shown throughout history. It recorded in the Bible in the Old Testament, we see Jehovah, Yahweh, God, Almighty God, connecting with people through the nation of Israel and the rest of the world. We see today through Jesus Christ and through the presence of his Holy Spirit, God himself is implementing this participation, uh, pa- this participation principle in our lives. He wants to participate in our lives through the presence of his word and his Holy Spirit. So in Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, we see these, com- these are the commandments I give you today to be upon your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. You see, God intends us to make our whole life an object lesson and a learning opportunity about what it means to be in relationship with God and our understanding or lack of understanding. And one of the things that I would encourage you to do, because folks, I've studied the Bible now a long time, and uh, I've given my life over to wanting to continue to grow and, and learn about Christ and serve him and help you all learn and grow. But I'm telling you right here, I still have so much more to learn. There is so much that I don't know. And I'm going to be honest with you about it. I'm not going to stand up here and say, I've got all the answers. You got questions about God. Just give me a call and we'll get it all worked out. But I'll tell you that we're on a journey together and I'm going to share with you what I've learned to this point and as I continue to learn, I'll continue to share. And I believe that's a model that you, every single one of you could do with your kids. Even if you feel like, well, Mark, I I hardly know anything about God, then great. Tell your kids that and say, you know what, I don't know much, but I'm going to start learning. And we're on this journey together. That's something I think genuinely with authenticity your kids will respect about you and it might just open their spirit and their heart to want to seek God out and learn with you as well just something to think about so we've talked about the pattern we've talked about the participation and I just want to close with this the proclamation principle because this is so important the proclamation principle is the truth uh, that how you speak to your kids and about your kids has a huge impact on their self-image and their behavior God puts within each one of us a desire to want to have approval from our parents we want to have approval from our mom we want to have approval from our dad And so often in situations where those relationships are not healthy, we lack hearing that approval. Or even if somehow um, we think as parents we're communicating that, somehow it's not coming across to our kids. There's a book that's been written a good while ago. It's been out for a long time. I use it in counseling, marriage counseling, premarital counseling. It's called The Five Love Languages. There's five different ways that people perceive Uh, love being communicated to them and this message isn't about that but uh, this is just an example of how we can think we're communicating love and speaking affirmation to kids or our spouse and maybe we're not and those five things are words of affirmation quality time giving of gifts uh, acts of service and physical touch And so your love language might be one of those, but your kids might be something totally different. So you're speaking your love language thinking they're getting it. Like if your love language is physical touch, you think hugging your kids is saying, you know, is is communicating love. But maybe that child's love language is words of affirmation. So if you're not building them up and speaking positive things in their life, they're still not feeling affirmed. So these are things that are good for us to be aware of. And God actually models all five of those love languages. Though 
You're not going to see the term love language in the Bible. I'm just saying these are principles that have been discovered that um, I believe when you look at the Bible, they absolutely make sense and they do absolutely make sense in relationships because uh, in talking and dealing with couples over the years, and I know even in our own marriage, my wife and I, uh, it has been so helpful to us once we have understood that principle. So God puts that within each one of us and the Bible talks about this, the words of affirmation aspect or the proclamation principle is so important in the lives of our kids. The Bible calls it speaking a blessing. In the New Testament, we see Jesus practicing this. I mentioned this verse in my message last week talking about the importance of kids' ministry. But when Jesus, when children were brought to Jesus and some of the disciples said, oh, you know, we think Jesus is too busy and he's helping all these adults, so, you know, don't let the children come. And Jesus got upset when he found out his disciples were telling him that. And he said, he he got indignant and he said, stop it. He said, let the kids come to me. For of this, of such as this is the kingdom of heaven. And then it says this in Mark 10, 16, and he, Jesus, took the children in his arms, laid his hands on them. So there's one of those love languages, physical touch. He laid his hands on them, but then the words of affirmation, he spoke blessing, he blessed them. So he literally was speaking blessing over their life. Dads, we need to learn to do this with our kids, with grandkids, with our spouses, we need to learn to verbalize more what we appreciate about them or our hopes and desires and dreams for our children. Along with, of course, correcting when needed. But we also need to speak blessing. Listen to this. In the Old Testament, in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27, God was telling Moses, again, when he was setting up the culture and society under his guidelines, he wasn't just this mean old God that was waiting for people to step out of line and then he was going to bash them over the head. God's a God of justice, but he's also a God of great love and mercy and compassion. And we see this reflected in what God told Moses in this proclamation principle. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his son saying, this is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the children, so shall they put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. Isn't that cool? God's heart is to speak a blessing over your life because he loves and cares about you. So are we following that model in doing that with our kids? So in closing, I just want you to think about this. What are you proclaiming to and about your kids? Do your words help or do they hinder? Do they correct, which they should, Or do they criticize and come overly critical? Do your words hurt or do they heal? Make sure we think about these three principles. First of all, the pattern principle. Then um, the participation principle, spending time. And then thirdly, the proclamation principle. What are you going to speak and model for your kids. So dads, again, thank you for being here today. I hope this has encouraged you. Uh, and, and, and again, I don't know about you, but as a guy, I need to be challenged. So I appreciate getting challenged. And, and I've been challenged once again from this message as I was preparing and looking at it and seeing things that I still need to work on, even though now in my parenthood uh, stage of life that I'm in, and our kids are adults now, but you never stop being a parent. It just kind of changes. And uh, so, and, and for those of you that aren't parents, you never stop being a kid, so you're going to relate to your parents. So again, there's something in this for everybody today, whether you're a dad or not, whether you're a parent or not. So we all have fathers, but regardless of what your earthly father may have been like, above all, I want you to know that you have a heavenly father who loves you, who wants, who has set the pattern for your life who wants to participate in your life and he proclaims good things for you in Christ Jesus. So the question is, will you put your faith in Christ and trust this heavenly father who loves you more than any earthly father could? Would you stand? Heavenly father, thank you for the opportunity today for this reminder. Uh, Thank you for the joy of seeing all the kids up here today. How awesome, What what a piece of heaven. 
Thank you, Lord, that in our community here in the Mid-Ohio Valley, we see a mixture of people. And again, uh, people of all stages and uh, ages and genders of life and all of these things. But Lord, forgive us when we've been influenced too much by the worldly pattern. Help us to look to you for the pattern that you have for us in our own personal life and for a healthy culture and especially for your church. And I pray today, Lord, if there's anyone listening who this message has touched, I just trust the leading of your Holy Spirit uh, that you're showing them the decision they need to make, whether it's to recommit their life to you, whether it's to trust Christ as their Savior, uh, whatever that decision is, to be a better dad, to be a better parent, uh, to be a better son or daughter or child. Lord, I pray in these moments as we sing this song uh, that we'll just determine in our hearts and what we need to do and that we will have the courage and your help to follow through with this commitment and this decision we make this day in Jesus' name. Amen. So-